Once you get south of the Riverlands, very different sorts of trees start to take over. Maple, elm, beech, poplar. The odd willow. This venison, it's very tasty. Is it from today's one? Well, no, we haven't been able to cure that one yet. This is last week's. North of the wall, you don't hunt, you don't eat. Mostly deer, or is it elk as well? Rabbits. I say we. It's my friend John, mostly. Sometimes Ed. Samuel, would you care for more bread? Oh, um, yes. Yes, please. Thank you, Mother. Not fat enough already. Man, I am so frickin' bored. I've been hanging in the dog net for weeks, and frankly, the plot hasn't moved forward at all. What was even the point of me being here? I'm out of here. And our episode begins with a reveal before the credits. The Hound is alive. Which we all kind of knew. But what we didn't know was that the Hound is apparently a superhero. And that's with a bum leg. Ugh, and next there's a little pet peeve of mine. This is a medieval-esque fantasy story, but for some reason they love to show potatoes. Potatoes are from the New World, Peru specifically. Right, but this is a fantasy setting. Couldn't they have whatever they wanted? Then where are the goddamn llamas? Actually, Brandon, my ancestor, Quellen Farwind, introduced the potato to Westeros 5,000 years ago. He traveled to the land beyond the sunset, where there's no winter or want. If it was so awesome there, why did he come back to your stupid little rock of a home? Ah, uh, I think there was a king's moat? Anyway, the timing of this scene is absolutely baffling. The Hound was wounded at the end of season four, and since that, we know that Brienne has done a whole bunch of crap. She followed Sansa north, she waited for her escape, she rescued her, she brought her to the wall. It's enough time that Walda Frey went through a full pregnancy. But Ray is acting like they barely know each other, which also doesn't make any sense as the Hound would have spent about three months healing from his broken leg. So how long has the Hound been here? Two weeks? Three months? A year? No answer makes sense. And then we find ourselves back in the party room! God, I love the party room. Anyway, the High Sparrow asks Marjorie why she isn't fucking Tommen, and Marjorie says it's because she hasn't been horny. And so the High Sparrow says, put out or get out. Bang the boy or I hurt your grandma. And so Marjorie meets with the QOT, and with the loudest crinkling paper on earth, tells her to get the fuck out of town. Marjorie being unconverted wasn't much of a surprise, was it? Well, Marjorie's character is mostly insincere all the time. We meet her and she's insincere to Renly. Then she's insincere to Joffrey, and insincere to Sansa, and insincere to Tommen, and insincere to Cersei. We've seen the real Marjorie like four times. I can remember once with Littlefinger, once with the QOT, and twice with Loras. Oh, there's that time that Cersei brought her shit for dinner. Fine. Five. Hello, my name is Johnny Snow, and I would like you to join in the most amazing fight. Hello, I am the Onion Knight. It's a battle that will help prevent the longest night. It's a fight against Roose Bolton's son. You won't believe how many things this will set to right. Hello, my name is Sansa Stark. I'd like to whine to you about my family's plight. So it turns out that Elder John is pretty shitty at negotiations. He fails to convert anyone, and it falls to Tormund to convince everyone that Jesus died for their sins. Tormund essentially says that because John died for them, they need to die for John. Of course, this is a pretty shitty argument. There's a big difference between dying permanently and dying temporarily. Anyway, John is unsure if the wildlings will come, but Tormund assures him that wildlings aren't clever. When they say they'll do something, they do it. So I guess that confirms it. Ali's parents were eaten right in front of Tormund and Egret. And then Cersei goes to visit the QOT right before she leaves. I do have to hand it to the QOT. 
She insults a vindictive, insane woman while she commands a zombie behind her. You have courage, Olena Tyrell. Next, we find ourselves in the Riverlands with Jamie and Braun. Jamie once again offers Braun a lady and a lordship. Of course, a lady and a lordship is what Jamie promised Braun for coming along to Dorne. So he never delivered, which makes me wonder why Braun is trusting him again. The two find the phrase threatening to hang Lord Edmure. Of course, Edmure has been dispossessed. He's not lord of anything. Quite ironic that the Freys are showing more respect to Edmure than the Blackfish ever did. Anyway, the Blackfish gruffly whispers, go on then, cut his throat, and everyone hears from hundreds of yards away. Jaime then takes control of the siege and is angry at the Freys for allowing 8,000 men to surprise them. Of course, this is exactly what happened to Jaime in the Battle of the Whispering Wood. Next, we make it to Bear Island, and this is a great scene and this little girl is awesome, but there's a few problems I have. John is just gallivanting in there with the Mormon's ancestral sword. Even if they didn't realize it was hanging right there on his hip, you'd think they'd ask about it. It is their family's most prized heirloom. I doubt they'd be thrilled about a bastard deserter having it. Next, Lyanna reaffirms that they swore fealty to the king in the north. That's Rickon. How is no one mentioning this? And if he's not king, he's certainly lord of Winterfell. Third, did Lyanna call Sansa Sandra? In Lady Sandra's a Bolton. That sounds like Sandra to me. In Lady Sandra's a Bolton. I kind of wish it weren't a goof. It would be an awesome diss. Anyway, the scene seems kind of pointless because only 62 men are provided, but now we are absolutely certain that the Maesters of the Citadel know about the White Walkers. Of course, Castle Black sent out a raven years ago about this issue, but now the Maesters know that people are taking it seriously. So next, Jamie goes to treat with the Blackfish. The Blackfish's cause is hopeless, but he refuses to surrender because this is his home. I mean, sort of. He hasn't really lived there for decades. It's more of his childhood home. But whatever, it makes him sound like a badass grumpy old man, which is what show Blackfish is about. Anyway, we next get this pretty awesome scene where the Glovers tell John and Sansa to fuck off. The Boltons help them get their castle back while the Starks failed. It sounds like this guy's wife and kids are still with the Ironborn. If we follow the book, this is Robet Glover, and his family is held prisoner by House Harlaw on the Iron Isles. But this is the show, so I guess his family might be being brutalized by Euron. So considering that Jon and Sansa have been all over the North, I assume this episode takes place over the course of months, which would help explain why Theon and Yara have made it all the way to Volantis. And if you notice, Theon is having some PTSD because he was around naked women right before he got his dick cut off. Now Yara wants to make a pact with Danny. Which makes me initially say, huh, maybe this isn't the Victorian plot. Maybe this is the Quentin plot. Except Quentin actually did have some things to offer. He had the Spears of Dorne. Yara and Theon have some ships, but certainly not enough. We shall see if they make it to Slaver's Bay before Danny. Danny should beat them. She's only a week away, according to the last episode. It'll be interesting to see if the Ironborn pick up some pork or end up descending into the pyramid. Anyway, Theon pulls out of his hat a look of awesomeness which naturally leads to Yara belittling him by saying that she's going to go fuck someone without a penis. Sad Theon. Now next we find ourselves back in the north and Jon wants to attack Winterfell now. Sansa though wants to recruit the Serwins or the Kerwins. John doesn't want to go get the Serwins because he thinks winter is coming and a storm might hit. Now in this situation, Sansa is completely correct and John is wrong. Because there aren't any meteorologists in this world, we have to accept that the chances of a storm hitting this week are roughly the same as the chances of a storm hitting last week. John thought going to Bear Island was worth the risk. He ought to think that going to Castle Serwin is worth the risk. After all, the chance of a storm is the same, but Castle Serwin actually has a larger reward. Now yes, Rickon is in danger, but he hasn't been executed so far. His execution is much like the weather. The chances of it happening next week are roughly the same as last week. And then Sansa gets an idea. She'll send a raven. Now hold on a second. The maester seems to have two ravens. I'm supposed to believe that one of those two ravens is a Moat Kaelin raven? Maybe it's a Bear Island raven, and then they would forward the message to Moat Kaelin. But who would forward the message? The Bear Island maester is here. The only explanation that I can think of is that they knew that the Hornwoods would join and he brought his Hornwood Ravens. And then the maester at House Hornwood would forward the message. But in all actuality, I don't think the writers thought about this at all. Anyway, then Sansa writes whoever is in command of the Knights of the Vale. This is probably Littlefinger. And we're back with Septon Ray, who gives a pretty awesome speech that's very similar to the Septon Maribald speech in A Feast for Crows. Lem Lemoncloak shows up with the Brotherhood Without Banners and maybe threatens them? 
Next, we find Arya gallivanting around Bravos, brazenly booking passage for Westeros. Now, everything about this scene seems off. Arya is walking differently, her hair and clothes are different, she doesn't have needle, she tosses coins with her right hand despite being left-handed, she foolishly hangs out in public. It all seems off. Oh, come on, sweet Robin. How many times are you longingly going to look for complexity? You wanted the pink letter to have depth. You wanted Dorn to have depth. You wanted the Sons of the Harpies to have depth. You wanted John's resurrection to have depth. You wanted the King's Landing plot to have depth. You wanted Stannis' death to have depth. I still haven't seen Stannis' body, and many of those things are still possible. The point is, from season five on, we have not had any secret, mind-blowing scheming that made us re-examine everything. The closest thing we had was Ilaria pretending to be loyal to Doran for like an episode, and Marjorie pretending to be converted for like an episode. I still have hope. I think the most you can hope for is Jock and killing the Waif for making Arya suffer. Arya was clearly panicked about almost getting killed. And man, those Bravosi not caring that a blind girl was getting beaten up was not a goof. The Bravosi are the worst good Samaritans ever. Anyway, we're bound to have a TaxSlayer.com faceless bowl. Meanwhile, back in the Riverlands, the Hound is chopping some wood when, oh no, all of his friends were killed. Sad Hound. And despite George R. Martin saying that Lady Stoneheart was cut from the show, we seem to have some evidence that she's going to show up. Well, you know, the Brotherhood would hang people before Lady Stoneheart as well. And we don't really have any definitive proof that this was the Brotherhood. Oh, go to hell, sweet Robin. Next thing you know, you're going to tell me that there's not going to be a GoDaddy.com Clegane Bowl. Well, I guess we're gonna have to take and Hey, how's it going? My name is Chad Summerchild. Well met, my lord. My name is Sandra Stark. Um, so do you like beer pong? Do I? Maybe we could hang out sometime. Oh, crap. <laughs> Geronimo! That's all for now. See you in a couple days at the episode 7 serious Q&A. Put Q&A colon before your questions in the comments below.